Canto 28 of The Paradise asks us to move into a mode of perception that has been present throughout the Divine Comedy, but now is fully required in order to communicate a sense of where Dante and Beatrice now are in the Prima Mobile. They've entered this zone of reality in the last canto, and that was signalled by a series of reversals. You remember that Dante sees the souls, the lights, floating upwards, and yet somehow they were floating downwards as if snowflakes. He has heard St Peter give this enormous invective against the church, and yet had asserted that the life and light of heaven is greater than anything which people might try to substitute it for on earth. And so that is drawing his attention towards that higher, truer, original source. And then Beatrice has described to Dante a new light that they've seen that actually is the source of all light. It's the still centre that is also somehow the circumference of everything. And it is, while still, at the same time, the source of the motion of everything. A number of paradoxes to describe the divine light, to describe God, whose centre is everywhere, whose stillness actually draws all towards it. These seeming paradoxes are going to dominate Canto 28 now. And I think it's important or worth while noting right from the get-go that they can't be understood rationally. They can't be logically put together. But they make sense when perceived with the mind's eye. The prima mobile can't be seen with the senses. And yet when tuned into, its presence can be felt everywhere as underpinning the motion, the containment, the light of the universe which we can see and which Dante and Beatrice have been travelling through thus far. This sensing that which is implicit is I think almost like a kind of knack or initiation that once you get it you realise the reality of these things which otherwise can't be empirically detected. Um, it's a bit like the physicist who gets the hang of mathematics realising that whilst laws of nature are never written explicitly in nature, they see its pattern and its shape throughout the whole of nature, and so can do physics. Um, mathematics is often um, used in a similar way, and I think it's why some people always struggle with mathematics, whereas others just get it. Um, you know, some people never quite learn the knack of fractions, um, in slightly more advanced mathematics, never quite understood the significance of the square root of minus one. And yet when you get how powerful these irrational um, expressions of mathematical truths are, mathematics becomes a language that you can speak very fluently. You see a different analogue to this, I think, in psychotherapy. Um, one of the trainings that you undergo in psychotherapy is to learn to trust what might be called your counter-transference counter or your intuition. Um, you're not quite sure where it comes from. Um, if you try to explain it to someone else, they'll say, well, you, you say it, it feels, it's a feeling in the room I had. Um, it sounds not very sure. And yet when you learn to align with that sense, you know it is telling you something for sure. It's not always straightforward to discern what it's telling you. Um, but nonetheless, you learn to trust it. I think many forms of divination are like this, and particularly the divination which isn't mechanical, um, which in my view tends to be a false kind of divination, precisely because it's not tuning into this deeper pulse that's embedded in all things. I'm um, scrying, uh, using symbols, um, muscle testing, uh, all sorts of things that people have devised in order to use their physical presence, their um, felt sense of things to somehow be at an edge of that felt sense 
and be receptive to that which is coming in from more than just the felt sense and then undergoing often long trainings to learn how to receive that. Um, mathematics and divination might seem very different things, but I think in their, when used by adepts, they are actually tapping into the same capacity which we humans do have um, on the other side of being initiated into them, um, which is this ability to see with the mind's eye, to see with the intellect in its truest sense, it's not just about being smart or clever. It's about tuning into these deeper currents, patterns, ways, laws. The logos would be a Christian way of putting it. That is both the source and sustainer of life. And in the Prima Mobile, that is the level of reality that Dante is grappling with and becoming capable of now, of course, with Beatrice's ongoing help like her puzzles describing the centre that is also the circumference of everything, the stillness that is also the generator of all motion in the visible cosmos. So it begins the canto with some little snippets that give us an indication of this flip, of this reversal um, that he is undergoing and that he's inviting us to feel into as well. Um, he says that he leaves humankind's miserable and adverse state, which St. Peter had so um, roundly denounced in the last canto, um, to be with the light that paradoxically is the source of all life and of which human beings are also capable. Um, he says that he turns to Beatrice's eyes, which imparadise him. And it's a wonderful neologism to be imparadised. And again, there's that paradox there that this is paradise which he's freely entering into and you can't be part of unless you're completely free. And yet somehow it holds you. It draws you towards itself as well. Um, that sense of a vision that's so powerful, so desirable um, that it holds you and yet it draws you freely. You want it. You're, you desire more and more to be aligned to it. And that's another example of this kind of tension. Um, he says that um, it's like when you see the candlelight in a mirror reflected, then turn around and see the candle in actuality behind you and in your mind put together both the reflection and the reality um, and see how they're part of the same cosmos. Um, or he says it's uh, like music um, when the noise of music becomes harmony and become, becomes beauty and not just noise itself. You know, often when encountering new music, you have to kind of tune into it to understand it. It doesn't release its inner life immediately. But then when you get it, goodness me, you wonder how you never got it before. This is the kind of movement of the soul, this mind's eye movement and this inner intellect as a kind of resonance with deeper things that Dante is pointing to now. And then he sees in Beatrice's eyes a tiny, intense, brilliant, but infinitesimally small point of light. Remember that he's looked into Beatrice's eyes and seen images of the divine before. Um, for example, at the top of Mount Purgatory in the Garden of Eden, when he'd seen the griffin reflected in Beatrice's eyes moving between divine and human images, he wasn't able to quite put them both together at that point. At this point, he is seeing in Beatrice's eyes nothing less than the light of God in God's self, the Godhead. And it's like a light, he says, and yet somehow it's so much more than a light. Um, for example, its size um, is so small that even the smallest star, which you can see from these high heavens, would look like a moon compared to this point of light that he's seeing now, the divine source. Um, he only knows of that tiny, tiny, but massive intensity with the mind's eye. Um, you couldn't see that with the empirical eyes but somehow he's intuiting as well as seeing that this is what the ground and originator of all being, being itself, must be like. Um, nowadays, um, analogies with black holes immediately come to mind. 
um, but this is the inverse of a black hole. You know, a black hole which has achieved a gravity so dense that effectively it reaches infinite gravity because even light can't escape from it. Well, he's seeing what might be thought to be the opposite of that now, an infinite source that is so intense it yields all life and light into the cosmos. Um, but remember, it's only an analogy. Um, black holes are things in the physical universe, even if they bend the laws of physics to the point of destruction. Um, Dante is asking us to move even beyond the analogies and get that direct sense of divine life within us. And as he looks, um, he realises it's too much to take in. Um, again, it can only be kind of glimpsed out of the corner of the mind's eye. Um, but what he does see are a series of concentric um, circles of light um, that are moving around this source. Um, and what he notices is that the ones closer to the source are moving more speedily than the ones which are less close to it, that slow down as they come away from the source. There's nine of them all together. And over the first part of the canto, and Dante counts the nine. And as he moves two, three, four, five, we feel the distance growing from the source and the slowing down as well. Now, Dante is bewildered at this because his experience to date has been the reverse of that. Um, in his pre-Copernican imagining of the cosmos, the Earth had been at the centre. And as they moved away from the Earth through the heavens of the Moon, Mercury, Venus, the Sun, Mars, Saturn, Jupiter, um, sorry, Jupiter, Saturn, and then into the fixed stars, um, things had speeded up until in the Prima Mobile, um, things were moving so fast that everything was actually equal. There was no differentiation. Um, and so the further from the point, um, the faster things had moved. And now he's seeing the reverse of that for the closer to the point, the faster things move. And Beatrice notices his bewilderment and says that pure speck of being um, is the source of all truth. And the closer that the lights get to it, the more that their love of that light generates motion. And so the faster they go, the closer they get to the, the closer they get to the point. It bewilders Dante because he also knows that the closer you get to the divine, the more freedom, the more space, um, the more of life there is. And yet he sees it somehow tightening as it gets close to the point source. Um, you know, a, a physical analogy might be if you're spinning um, an acorn on the end of a string um, and you shorten the string, um, the acorn will spin more and more speedily close to your hand. Um, and yet it's got less room for manoeuvre. Um, whereas the thing he's seeing now, intuitively, and with his mind's eye, um, is that the closer to the light, the more freedom and life that he knows they are enjoying. And so he's not sure how this can possibly be. And I think that Beatrice's um, description that it's love's motion that causes this dynamism is a key. Um, because coming from Beatrice, it will remind Dante of when he first fell in love with her, when the light from her eyes drew his life um, towards her so that the whole of his earthly life was in a way an orbit around her. And yet he would have also known that that felt like a kind of imprisonment, um, that it actually constricted and constrained his life. That's what infatuation actually does, even as it seems to increase the intensity of life. Whereas what he's seeing now is precisely the opposite, how when the individual has become fully themselves, when they've seen themselves completely, because as Dante has undergone, they've gone through this journey into the inferno up Mount Purgatory, through the spheres of the heavens. He's seen it all now, and so is able to voluntarily bring all that he is to this focus to an orbit around this pure spark of being. That is the difference. It's not the infatuation which excludes the rest of the world and actually deludes the person who is infatuated. 
Um, this is the love that can welcome the whole of the world and is entered into because the person knows themselves and so knows what draws them most truly, which is the ground of being, the light of all lights, the source of all vitality that they've ever known anyway. Dante then tells Beatrice what's confusing him because the world and the way that it works so far has, for example, equated more goodness with more space. This is what he'd found as he ascended through the heavens. Um, they became larger and larger in their circumference as their freedom and joy and light increased, whereas now he's seeing the opposite. And Beatrice replies by telling him that this is a difficult thing to understand. She says it's like a knot um, that's tied so tightly that you're not even sure how to begin to loosen it. Um, but she's encouraging him to enter this flip that enables him to appreciate what's going on in the prima mobile. And what she does is say to him, look, try this out. Um, rather than equating more with space or more with more time, instead equate more with greater virtue, with greater qualities. Um, it's a move from quantity to quality. And then, for example, um, she doesn't use this analogy, but you know, then um, it's like the pearl of great price, for example, um, one of the parables of Jesus. I think that the reason why um, the landowner sells all he has, buys the one field where he knows the pearl of great price is to be found, um, it's a completely mad thing to do um, for a landowner, usually, because the more land they have, the more risk they can bear, the more money they can earn, and so on. Uh, no, but in this spiritual transformation, you sell everything to gain sight, to gain possession of the one thing whose very intensity is worth more than everything else. Um, it's that kind of flip. Um, again, love can understand this. Love um, rightly discerns, not just love as a kind of madness or blindness. I think what Beatrice is also doing to Dante is encouraging him to see whether he can conceive of a geometric relationship between the spiritual reality and the material reality um, that wouldn't be possible to actually draw in material reality. Um, she's kind of fostering that inner capacity within his mind's eye now. And she says, look, in the spiritual domain, the smallest circle with the greatest life corresponds in the material domain to the largest circle with the greatest life. And then the second circle corresponds to the second largest circle in material life. The third smallest circle in spiritual reality corresponds to the third largest circle in material life. So you have these two circles of life, one in the material domain, one in the spiritual, but they're inversely related. You couldn't actually draw their correspondences on, say, a single piece of paper, but in your mind's eye you can see how that relationship goes. Um, it's one of the reasons why some Modern readers of Dante had said that what Dante is doing here is describing a hypersphere um, where there's a kind of inner dynamism to the three dimensional sphere that actually can be seen to be the source of the three dimensional sphere. Dante says to Beatrice that he gets it and um, he uses a rather beautiful image. He says it was like a fresh wind from Boreas, the northern wind, who's very um, intensity can clean the air so that you can suddenly see from a great distance. Um, he thinks that he gets it now and because he can see it that little bit more he sees more of this prima mobile, mobile life and because what he sees next is that these circles of light start to shower sparks. Um, they are countless. He says that they number thousands and then he says um, you couldn't put them on a chessboard, um, but what you think he means, this old um, game of if you put one light on the first square of the chessboard and two on the next and four on the next, doubling at every square, by the time you get to the last square on the chessboard you have got millions upon millions upon millions of lights. And it's that explosion of light that he sees in front of him now as he's able to understand a little bit more what's going on. He's getting that actually this intensity makes for more, not for less. 
um, as he would have thought previously. And these are the angels that Dante is now capable of seeing. They're not just abstract geometrical patterns anymore. Um, they're not even explosions of light. They are living creatures as well. And I think that that gradual unfolding through this canto is really significant because what it tells us is that reality itself at the end of the day is not abstract geometric shapes. It's not even patterns of light, dynamism and force. It is living through and through. And I think that explains why reason can't quite get to grips with this depth of reality, with these dimensions of being. It has to be a felt experience that you as a living creature stretched right to the limit of your capability become capable of. Um, it would be called the hermetic way in the spiritual tradition, the realization that we have to use a variety of tools and practices, um, undergo initiations, um, deepen different kinds of perception um, that occupy this fluid space that is neither purely rational, but also isn't completely irrational as well. Um, it's able to make these links. Um, you know, I think that that's why in mathematics there's always intuition for all that there's logic as well. Um, it's why, why divination works. Um, it's not just random association. It's the ability to see the meaning within a seeming random association. That's what a living mind can do when it brings all that it has, um, its intellect, its aesthetic appreciation, its desire, um, its playfulness as well. When you bring all those aspects together, then you see the fullest vision of reality that we're capable of and which Dante sees now in the angels. And angels are like that too. Um, again, you know, some people um, would just uh, decry them. Um, others would say, well, you know, they're psychological forces that are personified somehow. Um, others, again, would experience them as entities around them that perhaps they don't see, but they sense um, have an autonomy of their own. Um, you know, sometimes it's said that our thoughts um, are a bit like the angels. Um, if you have a meditative practice, you'll know that your thoughts have a kind of life of its own um, that you can learn to relate to, you can learn to try and befriend, um, but that's the way to go about it, not just to try and turn them off and on. Um, and then of course um, people do see angels as well. Um, I've been very impressed by one very well-known angel seer now, Lorna Byrne. Um, I've met her and talked with her about what is going on in this capacity she has. Um, and I think that because of her upbringing actually, because she didn't have um, a usual education, she stayed open to a kind of sight um, which is almost like a sort of synesthesia um, that's able to link her visual perception with an awareness of these interior forces which are around and about. And so now she just sees them as angels. Um, my guess is that's what angel seers, um, you know, who are the real deal, um, I'm sure there's plenty that fake it and so on as well. Um, but for those who really do see um, this way into reality, it's something like that that's going on. Um, they have a, they're able to bridge um, different modes of awareness, um, which um, for most of us, perhaps certainly many of us, um, might take a long time in order to be able to join up um, and so see into the depths of things. Um, Dante makes um, something of a similar remark here when he sees the point of light. Um, he says that he realises in that moment that if you look properly into all things, then you will see this still centre at the base of all things. And again, I think that's quite a common meditative experience, contemplative experience, that underneath all the hubbub, um, all the confusion of inner life, and when that stills down just enough, there's this sense of a reality that is always there, is pure awareness, some put it, um, it's non-dual being, others would say, um, some might talk of the Buddha nature, um, some might talk of the private face in the Sufi tradition, um, in Christianity it would be called perhaps Christ the Logos or the Godhead. Um, that perception opens up and although maybe it's only glimpsed on occasion, 
once it's seen once is never quite forgotten and it's recognized as underpinning life itself. Beatrice then names the nine orders of the heavenly hierarchy for Dante, um, the seraphim, cherubim and thrones that are nearest to the divine source, then the dominions, virtues, powers and principalities, followed by the archangels and the angels. And I think the business of naming this hierarchy um, is again to give us some sort of felt sense of what this is really communicating. And the word hierarchy was actually coined by um, Dionysius, um, who described these orders of angels which came to shape um, the Christian and um, Islamic tradition as well, I think. Um, and the point about the hierarchy is not that they um, suppress the lower orders, um, it's quite the opposite. Um, this is a hierarchy that transmits and I think that that's why these angels have these kind of different functions. Um, it's this Neoplatonic tradition of emanation um, that um, the source of life can flow out um, in a love that never ceases but as it flows out diversifies and complexifies. Um, it increases the freedom that then returns back to the one um, in this great extravagant um, outpouring of life and light. Um, that is the function of the hierarchy. Um, it's to make for more life, not to keep people somehow in their place. Um, and um, Beatrice explains too, very interestingly at this point, that certainly the seraphim, cherubim and thrones, um, they are capable of the vision of God um, that keeps them closest to the divine. Um, there's been a bit of a tussle throughout the Divine Comedy um, as to whether it's intellect and vision that draws you to God um, or whether it's love and desire that does. Um, and sometimes it's said that love and desire can see kind of around corners um, because it feels the pull. And at times we've been encouraged, in fact, to nurture um, that desire to keep us with Dante on the ascent. Even when we don't understand quite what it is we're desiring, we feel we want more. But then at other times there's been the need to establish a kind of intellect and vision, knowing what we're seeing in order that we can be fully present in the point that has been reached um, through the development of these capabilities. And now in this moment, I'm in the Premium Mobile, um, Beatrice is expressing to Dante that it's his intellect, it is the vision that counts. Um, I think that is also expressing something of the character um, of being in this um, ninth sphere of the heavens. Um, the character that's required really to see it is this inner eye, um, is the sense of the stillness that somehow it's also um, full of life. Um, when we experience that now, even in a glimpse, and when we discern that now, um, even through some other means, um, of some other intermediate means, um, that is to share something of what Dante knows very directly here in this canto. And then I think something of this um, dialectic between um, vision and between love um, is expressed in the last comments that Dante makes in the canto. Um, he corrects himself, as many of the commentators note, um, because in his earlier work, The Convivio, he described the heavenly hierarchies in a different order um, as um, were um, put by Gregory the Get Great. And now he's switching as well his allegiance to the order described by Dionysius. And whilst this is a sort of interesting um, detail about Dante changing his mind, I think it also expresses an important truth um, at this point in the journey as well. Um, because whilst um, desire and love um, will lead us, ultimately I think it must be vision and intellect that enables us to settle on what we see. And if you don't have that settling, then you just have the desire. And so you get the argument, you get the squabble, um, say, between Dionysius and Gregory. And whilst in their case, I don't think it led to anything too disastrous. Of course, spiritual squabbling can lead to the worst disasters of all. And we have half an echo of the corruption of the church as well. And so the stress here, I think, on settling into the vision um, is put um, you know, this makes sense to me as a psychotherapist as well. Um, ultimately, you must know from the stillness within yourself about your life. Um, you must gain that steadiness from that vantage 
um, so that whilst difficult things can still happen, of course, um, painful, even terrible things, that steadiness is there for you to return to, to keep coming back to. Um, that would be, I think, the kind of more humdrum human analogue of this spiritual intellectual vision that Dante has been communicating to us um, in this canto, even as Beatrice stressed it to him. And he ends the canto by saying, it is very remarkable that he, a still mortal living person, has been into these higher heavens and has had these truths revealed to him. Um, he's saying to us what can seem slight, marginal, just a glimpse in our everyday life, actually, when followed through, is seen to be the truth, the more fundamental expression, um, even the very source of reality. And um, when you make the ascent as he has done, he is encouraging us to stay with the paradoxes, even though they can stir up our desire and cause frustration and confusion. Um, to trust that we are made in the image of God, and so, like if differently from the angels, can become capable of sharing fully in the life of God. And he's doing that because he himself has reached this place of steadiness, of sight, of trust that is enabling him to see and know in this way with the mind's eye. And yet, this is heaven. One sight always leads to a further question and the possibility of more sight, which is what's going to happen to Dante next.